Hi everybody, I'd like to introduce David Antonucci. He is here to talk to us about the history that Mark Twain has in the area and the interaction he had while he was up here. Now, I would like to thank the Sierra State Parks Foundation for um, supporting California State Parks and bringing in the Sierra Speaker Series to help fundraise. So I'm gonna turn it over to David Antonucci now and I hope you enjoy. For those of you who may not know much about Mark Twain, he's one of the most revered uh, American writers uh, in, in our literary history of the United States. He's considered the father of the American novel. Of course, Huckleberry Finn, you probably heard about his, uh, his novel, but he's written a, a lot of different books. He has a great body of work, uh, immense body of classics and articles and newspaper stories, but when he was young, he did come up to Lake Tahoe, and he was really, like all of us, he was deeply moved and impressed by it. It became the gold standard to which he compared all other lakes, because he traveled the world afterward, writing about other places in the world, and he compared other lakes to Tahoe, but they never measured up. It was his gold standard, and uh, he often said that he would like to come back to Lake Tahoe to die, but he was afraid that he'd make a failure of it because the place was just so beautiful he would just go on living. <laughs> so where this all started for me was trying to figure out where his timber claim and wildfire was. That's a, can we drop the lights? Uh, it's yeah, thank you. Uh, that was an image out of his book, Roughing It. Uh, and I began researching, trying to figure out where he was at Lake Tahoe. As you know, every chamber of commerce around Lake Tahoe likes to claim Mark Twain was here. And it's like Washington slept here or whatever. And so I was going to figure it out. And uh, it turned out to be quite a research project. Of course, it all begins with his book, Roughing It, which was published in 1872. And it's his memoir of the six and a half years in the West. Uh, it's where he came out and uh, where he actually became Mark Twain and then went back east. I also was able to draw on some of the letters he wrote from that area. He, believe it or not, there are 5,000 letters that he wrote that still survive. And so there's a lot of information in there and they're all in an archive down at UC Berkeley in the Bancroft Library. But he did write a couple letters while he was here to his mother and his sister. Um, also articles that he wrote um, for the Territorial Enterprise and other newspapers. Um, I'll explain how he got to work with the Territorial Enterprise. After he published his books, um, his first book, Innocence Abroad, and later Roughing It, he did lectures around uh, the United States and in the West, and those lectures were covered by newspapers and transcribed and reported in the newspapers. So what he said in the lectures about Lake Tahoe, where he was, was also important. Old maps that we were able to dig out uh, from the early 1860s uh, to describe, give us an idea of what Lake Tahoe was like when he was here. And then this is where a lot of people, uh, particularly, um, shall I say, English professors who tried to determine this themselves, where he was, they didn't have the background in limnology uh, and the biology of Lake Tahoe and the physics and geology of Lake Tahoe, which as it turned out, you needed to know that to understand what he was talking about. Mark Twain was not a scientist, but he was very good at making observations. And so he made observations that he wrote in the letters and in the books that if you read it and didn't know much about Lake Tahoe, you'd just say, well, that could be anywhere. But when somebody who was familiar with the lake read it, say, I know exactly where he's talking about, where he's describing the geology, where it's unique. So that became important. You also had to know what Lake Tahoe was like then compared to the way it is now. A lot of researchers have stumbled by saying that the way Lake Tahoe is now is the way it was then. So one researcher said, oh, here's the place there, here's the beach he slept on on the east shore. Well, if you go back and you look at the maps from that era, there was no beach there. 
1861. The beach was created when the dam was built and the shoreline started to erode. So there's no way that he could have slept on a sandy beach because there was no beach there at that time. And then finally, you just have to use logic and a, a good dose of skepticism because Mark Twain is Mark Twain and he will exaggerate and he will even say things uh, that are not true and you need to be able to ferret that out. And a lot of people have stumbled on that. The end result was my book, Ferris Picture of Mark Twain at Lake Tahoe, which the first book that focused solely on Mark Twain's time at Lake Tahoe and in the region, it includes Truckee and Alpine County. And when he was here, he was in the area from about uh, August of 1861 until uh, February of uh, 1864 when he left the area. Of course, he went on to be in the Mother Lode and of course then the Jumping Frog story and all that. But that was pretty much the end of his time at Lake Tahoe. Uh, these are all points that I have identified and, and confirmed uh, based on descriptions in the book or in his letters that these, these are in fact the areas that he was talking about. So there's quite a few points uh, that you're able to identify. A lot of people uh, will say he was on the east shore down here, but when you go back and you look at what he said and you match it up to the area, the geography or the geology, it actually was up in this area. It wasn't anywhere down here. And uh, from that, they were able to draw conclusions as to where certain events happened that he mentioned in the book, like walking up from Carson City, where he first saw Lake Tahoe, where he camped, and where he broke into a pioneer's cabin and, and quote unquote borrowed the canoe. So we put all this together and uh, were able to then reconstruct his timber claim and actually determine where it was located. This hole starts with uh, Mark Twain, he's about 26 years old and he's a riverboat pilot on the Mississippi. But the Civil War was <coughs> out in 1861 and the Union shuts down all the shipping on the Mississippi, so he's out of a job. Uh, this other guy is his brother, Orion Clemens. And Orion was appointed to be secretary of the ne newly formed Nevada Territory by Abraham Lincoln. And so, uh, if you know your history, uh, the Nevada Territory was formed out of the larger Utah Territory because of the silver and gold strike at Virginia City, they wanted to have their own self-governance, and the Union, pro-Union people wanted a new state to enter the Union that would be a free state, not a slave state. So there was a lot of work done to create uh, the Nevada Territory so you could enter the Union as a state, as a free state. And the way this worked out is, Orion had the job in Nevada, but he didn't have the money to get here, but Sam, his brother, Sam Clemens, said, I'll pay for your way out if you give me a job when you get there. And so the two brothers uh, traveled from, by stagecoach from St. Joseph, Missouri to Carson City. And this was a 20 day trip and it's written up in the book. And he, uh, he talks about the different stops and the scenery he saw, uh, encounters with Native Americans, the Pony Express, uh, the Mormon culture and things like that. Uh, they get to Carson City in August of 1861, and this is basically what they see. It's a, you know, it was customary at the time you, you'd name your town city, and that and that was so people who hadn't been there would think, oh, it's a city, it's a big place, <laughs> but there's a lot of people and a lot of amenities and development. So this was Carson City, and uh, really all it was was some ramshackle buildings, tent, you know, tents on platforms, uh, dry, desolate, uh, windy, wild, kind of the way Carson City is now. And, uh, so as it turned out, he got to Carson City, but Orion didn't have a budget, a government budget. He didn't have any money to pay him. So Sam had to do something to support himself, and so he started looking for things to do and ways to make money 
and he had heard all this talk about Lake Tahoe and the fact that you could go up into the Lake Tahoe Basin and if you were on the, in the Nevada Territory, you could claim land. You could, you could homestead it, 320 acres, and then you could sell the timber off to a sawmill because there was high demand for timber in the Virginia City mines to shore up the mines. So what they were gonna do, uh, he and a friend who he met in Carson City by the name of John Kinney, they were gonna go up uh, to Lake Tahoe and stake out this, this timber claim to look for a spot. This is what Mark Twain's Tahoe was like in the era of 1861 to 65, 1865. Uh, there, it basically was a wilderness totally undeveloped. There was no dam at the outlet. It was a free-flowing outlet. Uh, the lake actually was much lower. It didn't peak as high as it does now. It was actually lower. <clears throat> the Washoe tribe was in residence around the lake. They were in the area. There weren't much, wasn't much in the way of settlers. There was a, a main road that went through the south shore of Lake Tahoe, and that was the Lake Tahoe wagon road, and most of the traffic was headed east to the mines of Virginia City out of the, the towns and the economy in California. Even though this had been a one roadway that had been used headed west during the, the 49er gold rush, it never saw a lot of uh, settlement or that. So the, the lake was full of Wahan cutthroat trout, a lot, very large trout, which are now extinct in the lake. Uh, there was a lot of wildlife in the forest. There were um, Sierra bighorns that were roaming along the North Shore. There was grizzly bears, wolverines, uh, all kinds of wildlife that we, we don't see today because they are either extinct or they've been what's called extirpated, meaning extinct in a certain location, extinct here. The lake was uh, very clear. The, the clarity was probably over 120 feet. Uh, compared to where it is, which is about half of what it is now. Uh, or if I said clarity now is about half of 120 feet, it's about 60 or 70 feet of clarity. So it was quite a different place. Well, the, this starts with day one. Uh, they leave Carson City where they're staying, and as I said, uh, he met up with this guy who had just arrived in Carson City by the name of John Kinney, and they hike 11 miles according to Mark Twain, uh, up to the north shore of Lake Tahoe. And what they do is they follow roads for a while, and then when the roads peter out, they follow uh, trails that were uh, Native American washer trails until they got about right up in here, and then they, they met up with another uh, trans Sierra road called the Placer County Emigrant Road, which uh, went from Yankee Gems to the Washer Valley and it went along the North Shore and went through Olympic Valley and then down the North Fork of the American. And that was used a little bit during the, the 49 Gold Rush, but it wasn't really a good road. In fact, it was described more as a wide trail. It wasn't suitable for wagons. But anyway, that's where they um, got to uh, Lake Tahoe on that 11 miles of walking. They were on foot. He doesn't say this, but I concluded based on his description of where, what he saw when he first saw Lake Tahoe, that he had to have started walking at night. And I went back and checked my calendar for uh, September of 1861, and sure enough, about the dates that we think he came to Lake Tahoe, there was a full moon. So we think the two of them started by a full moon in the middle of the night and walked by the light of the moon, first above along flat land, went up one steep mountain, and then, uh, which he said was about a thousand miles high, and then uh, went down, uh, across the valley, and that valley they crossed would be Franktown Creek, uh, coming out of the North Shore, and then up again, uh, up another mountain, where they, uh, it's now getting to be daylight, and they encounter some Chinese workers and according to Mark Twain, they pay the Chinese workers to cuss out the people that told them to go this way. He didn't know they were talking. And uh, at both these high points, they look over and say, they don't see a lake, and they begin to wonder if they've been had, if somebody, if somebody had been pulling their leg and told them about this wonderful lake. 
So they continue on and they get within one mile of the lake. And as Mark Twain describes it, suddenly the lake bursts into view, a noble sheet of blue water raised above 6,300 feet above the level of the sea. And so that was his first sighting of Lake Tahoe, and I'll, I'll tell you a little more about that. Um, they continue on down uh, the hillside until they reach uh, the edge of the lake uh, where they find a boat. But this is the view that he had when he first saw Lake Tahoe for the first time. And I've been up there, and it is exactly as he described it, because you're in the forest, and, and then the terrain obscures the lake, so you could be close to the lake and not know it. But once you round the bend, and the spot is marked now, where you actually come out of the forest and around the bend, suddenly there's the lake. And if you didn't know the lake was there, you wouldn't see it to that point. But this was his view that he saw. Well, uh, as I mentioned, they uh, found a boat which had been left for them uh, by their friends. They, there was a, a group of friends they had uh, in Carson City that had come out of the territorial governor, James Nye, and they were kind of like hangers on, uh, sort of his, his group, his, his groupies, and they would come out and they, and, uh, they were called the Irish Brigade what the nickname for them was. And they, they kind of supported and, and helped the governor who, Governor Nye, who had actually come out from the East and had been appointed by uh, Abraham Lincoln. So they, it was their boat that he found, and he was told that it was there. And so he said he rode across a large bow of the lake uh, to the landmarks that signified the place of his, of the campsite. And this is uh, State Line Point. And here's a picture from roughing it, showing them rowing across uh, Crystal Bay. When they got to State Line Point, they found their cache of food and supplies in the rocks. And this, again, had been left for them by the Irish Brigade, and that would be their campsite, main campsite for them to start. And this is what it looks like uh, if you look at where the beach was in 1861. There was beach right in this area right here. And uh, so this is the area where he camped. But there's a, one other thing that I'll tell you that really locks it in. And he talks about uh, a sandy beach, which is a lot of sandy beaches, and a lot of boulders, large boulders that he could sleep in between in the sand. And then, he mentioned about a flat rock, which I'll show you in a second. Well, the next day, they get up, and uh, the lake is too rough for them to use the boat, so they're on foot. And they uh, go three miles along the shoreline to what is now Tahoe Vista. And they, he, they decide they like that spot because it's flat, it's got a beach, the trees are up to five feet in diameter, they're easily accessible. It's a good place to have a timber claim. And uh, the person he's with, John Kinney, said he wasn't going to go back the way they came because it was so rough. And if you know the boulders and the, the rough terrain here on State Line Point, you know what he's talking about. He said he wasn't going to go back that way. So they continued on, and I believe they had seen this cabin uh, from when they were more in this area. And uh, they might have had like a telescope with them. He did, Mark Twain does mention that he looked at Sierra Bighorn sheep through a telescope. So it, it implies that he had one with him. And so they found this cabin, uh, basically a squatter's cabin. I call it a pioneer cabin. And they break in. By then, uh, it's getting dark. And so they're waiting now for the moon to rise so they can find their way back. And they end up playing cards at the cabin. Once the moon rises, they then find a dugout canoe. Now this is not the dugout canoe, it's an example of a dugout canoe. And they take the owner's dugout canoe and they paddle it all the way back to their campsite where they uh, play cards on a flat granite rock and have their dinner. And here's the flat granite rock that he's talking about. Uh, 
He said it was granite, it was flat, it's in the right spot, it's above the water line uh, where he could uh, make use of it. Well, the next two days they spend working on the timber claim. What they have to do is they have to fence the property and they have to build a structure on it and show they're actually occupying it in order to qualify for a homestead. So first thing in the morning, uh, they catch a lahan and cutthroat trout, which they cook and eat for breakfast, and then head by boat to the timber claim where they work, uh, trying to cut the trees, build a fence, and build a, uh, a log cabin. But as it turns out, for Mark Twain, it was too much work to cut trees to build a log cabin. So instead of building the log cabin, this is their house, which is a brush house, a lead from State Line to Tahoe Vista. And this, so this is where the uh, timber claim was. Well, on the fifth day, uh, they spend the morning drifting out uh, offshore, looking down in the water. They're just totally entranced by the size of the boulders in the water, and if you uh, have been offshore of uh, State Line Point, then you know what he's talking about. This is another image from a book that shows them just drifting around offshore, looking down through the clear water, and you can see the boulders are huge, they're massive. He said the boulders in the water were the size of a village church, and there's, again, this is a, a clue as to where he was because Elsewhere on Lake Tahoe, the boulders are not that big. It's only in this area that the boulders are this big. So it's again an indication of where he was. Uh, they end up that later that day going to the uh, timber claim and they're gonna set up camp there. Mark Twain gets up off the boat, goes up into the forest and lights a campfire and then goes back to the boat to get more supplies. When he has his back turned, the campfire escapes and the, uh, the forest is ignited and now it's burning. And if you're familiar with uh, the conditions in this area in the afternoons, there's a, a pretty significant southerly wind that comes up every day and blows in that direction. So if the fire got started, it would take off pretty rapidly. It was also very dry. Uh, he said the pine needles ignited like gunpowder. And so this is a picture uh, that was drawn based on his description of the fire. And here it is. Uh, he's at the boat and his friend John Kinney is running through the flames to get back into the, to the boat. They sit on the shoreline and out, out in the water watching the fire burn. Now, if you read the book, and this is Mark Twain being Mark Twain, it is an elaborate conflagration of the fire, kind of like the fires we have now that just go and go and burn uh, thousands of acres. But we know that wasn't the case then, that the forest that, that in that era was a, a, a mature forest that was adapted to fire, and it was segregated it, itself into 10-acre groves. So if a fire did get started, it was pretty much limited to about 10 acres. And that's why the, there's no history of large fires prior, you know, up until the last hundred years because of the way the forest came back after it was logged. So we know that even though he describes a very elaborate, uh, intense fire, it wasn't anything like that. And in fact, in the letter to his mother, he says, we're going back to finish the claim. And if the fire, and as he said in the book, the fire burned up all the trees, no insurance. Uh, that's not what happened. The trees were fine. It just burned, it was just a low intensity ground fire that burned out saplings and, and smaller trees. So the next morning uh, they head back, they row back to uh, the East Shore, and then they uh, head back to Carson City of course, all the supplies and equipment have all burned up in the fire, so they got to pay back their friends for the, the losses. And then the question is, where was this claim? Well, this is where it was. In a letter to his mother, he said the claim that he filed, he went back, he didn't go back a second time, I think. 
and, and he filed a claim that was one mile by two miles, and it also included other friends and relatives. So each person uh, could claim 320 acres. So this claim was 1,280 acres and represented four partners uh, involved in it. And uh, so, unfortunately, there's no record of this claim anywhere. No paperwork, nothing, no maps, nothing. And of course, he could never say exactly where he was other than describe the natural surroundings because there were no towns, there were no roads, there was no way to measure or survey anything. So uh, it, it's a pretty interesting uh, challenge to try to figure out where he was based on his, his description. So now I'd like to, um, and then as I meant, uh, should mention here, he also said in a letter to his uh, mother that James Nye, who was the territorial governor, agreed to name the bay Sam Clements Bay. <laughs> and he said that he goes by that name by the inhabitants in that area. Well, there were no inhabitants. In that area. <laughs> and, uh, the name Sam Clements Bay never stuck. We know it today as Agate Bay, of course. Uh, but he claims it was named after him by the territorial governor. Well, um, as Hannah mentioned in the introduction, that tonight we're going to reveal uh, the, the trail that marks these places that I've told you about where Mark Twain was and how you can get there and visit them. Um, we'll begin. This is a, a real uh, general map of the various locations that are marked. There's uh, eight different locations. Uh, and seven locations and eight different panels. So we'll start with the first one. This is the Ferris pic picture of Vista Point. This is on the Tunnel Creek Road, and this is where he first saw Lake Tahoe, and there's a panel there. Um, if you're a mountain bike rider, you've probably gone by it, but you can also park at uh, near Tunnel Creek Cafe and then hike up the road. It's a little over two miles to get up there. And uh, on the Sierra Nevada Geotourism website, there's information on how to how to get there and then there was where he found the boat at hidden beach there's a panel now that's on the east shore bike trail that's the bike trail that starts here um, where uh, lakeshore drive comes into the state highway and goes all the way to sand harbor there's this uh, panel that's there now that describes the fact that he found the boat there and rode across um, crystal bay and then uh, this is State Line, I mean, yeah, uh, State Line Point. And this is Speedboat Beach. There's not a panel there yet, but there will be. Placer County is going to install their own panel, and that will document what happened there. But uh, you can go there and, uh, and visit and see if you can find that flat rock that he played cards on and used as a dining table. And then if you're feeling real energetic, you can go up to the old state line lookout. And while he was never there, there's a panel there that gives you an overview of where he was. So you can go up there and get a general overview by looking out over the lake to the west to see where the fire was and where the, the cabin was that he broke into. And then um, as you're headed west towards the timber claim, if you stop at North Tahoe Beach in Kings Beach, there's a panel there that talks about all the things he said about the health restoring effects of Lake Tahoe. Now, in his time, there was a belief that illness was caused by bad air. It's called the miasma theory of disease. It, it predated the germ theory. So they thought if you had illness, it was because you were breathing bad air. So in order to get off, if you had illness, you would come up to Lake Tahoe for good air, clean air. And so he talks about that. And that's probably some, some of the quotes that you've heard or read where he talks about uh, three months of camp life in Lake Tahoe would restore an Egyptian mummy to pristine vigor <laughs> and give him an appetite like an alligator. And uh, he also talks about uh, people that did come up to Lake Tahoe to die but ended up getting better and ended up having a long life. So you can stop there and read about it. 
And then uh, if you continue on, you'll get to Sandy Beach uh, in Tahoe Vista, which is where the timber claim, in that general area is where the timber claim was. And of course, that's where the wildfire was. So there's two panels there that talk about the timber claim and where it was and about the wildfire and it kind of explains uh, how he described the wildfire in the <coughs> and how it actually was and why it was different than what the kind of fires that we see now. Um, this is all on public land, by the way. And then the final panel is in um, Carnelian Bay at Garwoods. And just, just west of Garwoods is the location where the cabin was. There's no trace of it now other than there are some very large old growth trees there that were not cut during the logging era. And so by looking at old maps and pegging it to those old trees, uh, we were able to conclude that even though we don't have a map from 1861 that shows the cabin there, uh, it wasn't until 1865 that the area was mapped and the cabin does show up then in the 1865 map. So that's the, the trail. Um, and again, you can get information about it by going to the Sierra Nevada Geotourism website and uh, put in Mark Twain and uh, it'll come up and give you directions. Well, the question I always get was, why didn't he file his claim? Why is there no record of it? Why is there no paperwork? Well, one theory, which I disagree with is, he got involved in mining and decided that he was going to make his money in mining, which turned out to be a failure too for him. Uh, and so he just gave up on the timber claim. But the, I think the more obvious reason is that, as you've noticed, all this happens, almost all of it happens in California. It's in the, the California portion of the Tahoe Basin. And what you need to know is that you could not homestead land in California at that time. You could only homestead land in the Nevada Territory. This is an example of the kind of maps they had. And uh, here you can see, here's what's called Big Bear Lake, which is the old name for Tahoe. It doesn't even show where the state line is, and it shows things in all different locations. But this is an 1860 map, and they just didn't really have good mapping. So he didn't really know where he was. And I think what happened is he staked his claim in California. As it turned out, the surveyors were in the area at that time and they were sticking out the state line. And when he came back to file the paperwork at the clerk's office, they said, <laughs> you can't file it because it's in California. It, you, you can only file to homestead land in Nevada. And it wasn't until 1865 that you could actually homestead land at Tahoe uh, in California. So the, I think that's the reason is he, he just overshot where he was. He didn't know exactly where he was. The maps were not that good and he ended up in California. Well, as most of us know, he went on uh, to get a writing career uh, in September of 1862. He was given an offer to come to Virginia City and work for $25 a week at the Territorial Enterprise as a reporter. And at the time, he was down by Mono Lake uh, prospecting. So he walked in September of 1862 all the way to Virginia City. And in February of 1863, in an article that appeared in the Territorial Enterprise, it was signed Mark Twain, and that was the first time he used the name Mark Twain. Well, this being Truckee, it would not be a good idea to, to skip over the fact that Mark Twain was in Truckee also. Uh, not at the same time, but uh, he came in 1868, and uh, what he did, he was on a trip to the West to handle uh, arrangements for the publication of a book called Innocents Abroad, uh, which was a, a travel log that he had written about his travels around the world. And then he was also lecturing uh, in the gold fields of California, and uh, he had to get back east. And so he, while he was out here, he was gonna go visit his friends in Virginia City and give a lecture. 
And so what he did, he, he was in Grass Valley, and then after his lecture in Grass Valley, he went to Sacramento. And the next day, he caught the train from Sacramento and traveled all the way to trucking. But he didn't travel on the train in Truckee. If you're a student of Truckee history, you know that in April of 1868, the, the rail line wasn't completed yet. So what he did is he rode the train as far as Cisco. And that was the end of the line at that point. And what the railroad did is they put the passengers on a horse-drawn sleigh and then they pulled them on a sleigh over the Dutch Flat Donner Lake Toll Road to Truckee. And then at Truckee, they would get off and take a stagecoach the rest of the way of where it would go. In this case, he was headed to uh, Virginia City. But when he was in Truckee, he sent a telegram, and this is what he said, I'm doing well having crossed one divide without getting robbed anyway. Mark Twain. <laughs> That confirmed to his friends that he was on his way. And so, as I mentioned, then he took a stagecoach uh, and he would have gone out over the Hennes Pass Road uh, around and down through what eventually became Reno to Virginia City. And this is what uh, Cisco looked like in 1868. It just happened there was a photographer in the area about that time. And uh, the snow was very deep. Well, somebody told Mark Twain, the, the snow had been 68 feet deep that winter, and the records in uh, Sacramento show they had 150% of normal rain precipitation, but you can see how deep the snow is there. And here you can see the train is in a trench, right here, and Mark Twain mentions that. He said, snow was so deep, the train was in a trench of snow. Mm -hmm. And um, he was really impressed by that, and it, uh, left an impression on his mind about the, what it was like in California, the amount of snow you can get, and what the conditions were like. So uh, with that, uh, we'll conclude my presentation, but I want to leave you with his, his immortal words that he wrote about Lake Tahoe 10 years later in his book, Roughing It. And this is, he, he recalled the moment when he came out of the forest uh, on the Tunnel Creek Road, and this is what he said. We plodded on, and at last, the lake burst upon us. The noble sheet of blue water lifted 6,300 feet above the level of the sea and walled in by a rim of snow-clad snow mountain peaks that towered a full 3,000 feet higher still. As it lay there, with the shadows of the mountains brilliantly photographed upon its still surface, I thought it must surely be the fairest picture the whole earth affords. So with that, thank you very much. And, uh, <laughs>